show, we have a guest that I'm really excited to introduce. We have Steven, also known as the Calculator Guy, founder of DeFi Dojo and Define Logic. Steven, I've been a longtime watcher of your content, longtime fan, so excited we can talk today. Thanks so much. Equally excited and uh, have also been a huge fan of yours for a couple of years now. Awesome. Thanks. Yeah, we were just talking off screen about how time flies. <laughs> it's been three years since 2021 now, um, even though it feels like yesterday. Uh, but Stephen, I know I did a brief intro, but uh, why don't you share a little about yourself for viewers? Yeah, yeah, sure. So I'm I'm Stephen. Uh, I am sometimes known as a calculator guy because I used to make a bunch of like spreadsheet calculators for different DeFi projects, and people would ask me how to use them. So I started making like YouTube videos explaining them, and that's how I sort of got the moniker calculator guy. But now I do a few things. I lead the DeFi Dojo Discord, uh, which I call the best DeFi Discord in all of crypto. It is also like a like a decentralized think tank. We have ten thousand members, but a thousand of them are really active. We have members from like the, the DeFi Llama crew, the Osmosis team, uh, Ave. We have Lido in there. We have you know over sixty five different protocols represented in there, and it, we have like strategy competitions. It's a really great place. If you're interested, I can talk about that. Uh, but also, I have co-founded um, Define Logic Labs, which is a data science firm. We helped craft and do the data science for the major strategies on Sommelier, as well as virtually all the strategies on Quasar. Um, and yeah, we also work with like hedge funds and capital allocators. And so that's been a really, really cool uh, thing that I've been mostly into lately. And then there's also like DeFi Dojo validation. So if you're in IBC world uh, and you want to go validate your tokens, maybe qualify for some airdrops and you see us on that list, feel free to, uh, to delegate to us. We'd love that. Awesome. I actually didn't know that. I'll have to offer that as a recommended validator on my tutorials from now on. Yeah, Crypto Crew is amazing. Uh, they actually work with us on our DYDX uh, validator, or rather, we work with them. And and uh, also, I love Friends Validator. So, and then, like you know, of course, Donku, DIIC. Those are some other great validators. And CryptoCito. I mean, there's so many. Yeah, yeah, there's a lot of good ones. I always like to support people that I, I've uh, talked to, though. Um, yeah. So, I think a lot of people who are familiar with DeFi probably have been exposed to you at some point before. But uh, what is the origin of calculator guy what's your journey how did you come to be here it's it's almost like an embarrassing story uh there it, there's so much so many angles i could i could pitch it from but my like i played with ethereum when i saw like an ad for it on some web page and it was like ethereum went from a hundred dollars to two hundred dollars i was like okay cool i've heard of crypto before uh, why not and so i got into it. i think this was like 20 16, that sort of run. I, I bought some Ethereum. It went up to, I, I think it peaked around $400 and then I like, exited and that was it. And then the next run came. Uh, I did a little bit better. This was 2019. Um, and I kept like just fumbling the trading because, you know, I was a philosophy teacher at this point in time. I was teaching what they call theory of knowledge at an international school in New York, which is amazing. I got to teach kids from all over the world. So I had like students from Nigeria, from Korea, from China, from Japan, from Spain. Uh, and like pretty bright kids and it was a boarding school. So anyways, that was an awesome job. Um, but like long story short, they wanted me to do something I didn't want to do uh, during the pandemic. I said, no, I'm not going to do that. And, uh, you know, I got I fell into DeFi. So I started. Like I said, I was a really bad trader because I really hadn't studied it at all. I just thought, you know what? Uh, I know philosophy. I have a few degrees and, you know, just a smart person can do this. That's not how it works. You actually have to learn stuff to get good at it. So someone came to me with this opportunity and they were like, look, you just, you put your assets in this thing uh, called node and you just put it there and it locks up and it just gives you money. And I was like, oh, so I can't, I'm not allowed to touch it. I'm not allowed to sell it. This is perfect for me. Uh, and this was strong, strong block. If you remember that, it was a huge oh, yeah. Ponzi scheme. Uh, I did not know it was a Ponzi scheme at the time because I didn't understand it. I, you know, I was like, okay, cool. It's it's participating in validation. That's good for networks. I don't get it. I'm all about it. And that's when I started building these tools to calculate APR, estimate APYs, future returns. Uh, I, I built that tool. People loved it. I made an explain, explanation video on YouTube. That's how I got the moniker calculator guy. I started building more of these for other sort of like Ponzi-nomic protocols like Ohm and Time. Uh, one of my most popular videos to like my deep and sincere pain is a video explaining how to ape into like Time Wonderland, which is so tragic because uh, people still are like, why did you make that video? And I'm like, because I didn't know any better. I, you know, my very first protocol was StrongBlock. It's my like introduction protocol into uh, DeFi. So 
Anyways, after realizing what tokenomics were and how they worked and what inflation was, uh, I quickly pivoted to trying to do more risk-adjusted things. Um, then when the bear market hit uh, in like November 2021, I think, I pivoted to delta neutrality. So luckily, I was hanging out with uh, this guy named Professor Keith. Um, still love the guy. He, he might have some less flooding words to say about me, but he's a great TA guy. Uh, and I pivoted to delta neutrality. Because I was like, let me just get risk off. You say it's a bear market. I believe you. Um, and so I sort of became known as the Delta neutral guy, which was I would find out different ways to create strategies where you would not be exposed to the markets and sort of make money. And that that carried me throughout the entire bear market. I am fully risk on now. Uh, now we create strategies of all sorts of different types. When I, when I first started in YouTube, I couldn't monetize it because some sort of glitch with like, Google ads, AdSense or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, so people told me to create a Patreon. I was like, all right, I'll, I'll, I'll make it, but I'm not going to do anything over there because I don't know how it works. And I made it and I had a just ridiculous amount of support. I was mind blown. It didn't make any sense to me. Um, and then people on the Patreon were like, you should make a Discord. And I was like, I, I don't, I've never made one. Um, I mostly use Telegram, but I'll, I'll make one, sure. And I made that. Um, and eventually, you know, people wanted me to be monetized. So I monetized the Discord. Uh, and it blew up. It became huge. And so, you know, I always say that uh, all of my success is because of other people telling me what to do. It's not like I'm, you know, a genius or particularly clever. It's just that uh, people have pushed me towards success and I've been infinitely grateful. Um, I am a religious guy, so I thank God all the time. Uh, and yeah, it's been really cool. So now I'm doing the data science stuff. I'm doing, uh, we're doing vaults. I have a small incubator fund. Um, Wow, doing it's, it all. Yeah, it's a weird origin story, man. This is inspiring me right now. Um, one of my questions was going to be how you transitioned from YouTube to DeFi Dojo and uh, DeFi Logic, but it sounds like it was kind of seamless where, like you said, people were... Yeah, it was just where the demand went. So people asked me to do it. I thought, okay, this is a good enough idea. And I had the right people around me who were like, yeah, we can help you do this. Um, and really, like the people who helped me create the Discord... A great group of guys. They didn't like charge me anything. I didn't. They didn't like even let me pay them. Uh, they helped me set up all of the stuff, and then like they went out into the distance, and I got a, a new set of mods. And those moderators have been phenomenal. If you guys know um, Mar from the Discord, he's like he's brilliant. He's a genius. Jungle Book, who's a huge fan of you, by the way. Uh, he's like he said he, he puts oh, on all your podcasts at, at night, and he's like I just I just listen and I learn and I fall asleep. It's great. Uh, so fall asleep. Well, <laughs> he likes to fall asleep to podcasts, and he's like, no, I got has you. the perfect voice for just like yeah. listening and learning, and then just like dozing off. Not <laughs> no, 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 I, I feel what you're saying. You know, I actually do. Uh, uh, when I started the channel, I started doing voice exercises. I looked up exercises that voice actors do to try yeah. to make my voice more uh, powerful, full. Mm -hmm. is the word. Make my voice yeah. more full, and um, yeah, I, th th they work somewhat. Well, hey, you sound good, man. Thank you. Um, awesome. So that, that's really interesting. Uh, in a little bit, I want to get back to sort of some other questions we had. We put it out a uh, post on Twitter asking people for questions, and there were some about some of your other hobbies. But really want to make sure we get a chance to dive into the DeFi research since that was the bulk of bulk of what people were interested in. So first, to start from a ten thousand foot overview. How do you see DeFi, crypto, tokenization changing people's lives in the future? Changing people's lives. That's a big one. Um, changing people's well, lives or affecting our lives, right? You sure. Know, one of the interesting things is like if you go to uh, Turkey or, I mean, Argentina is another great example. Or heck, if you go to places in, in like Tanzania, uh, what you'll find is there is pretty surprising level of, of crypto adoption, typically in the form of like accepting Tron USDT, which, you know, from like people in the US is kind of surprising because we typically never interact with the Tron chain if we can help it. Uh, and like USDC is sort of a go-to. But internationally, Tron is huge. USDT is massive because it's like this sort of like seamless way to transact with a currency that is much more robust typically than their own. Uh, and so like crypto adoption is already happening at a pretty wide scale outside of the US in ways that are, are semi-surprising. So I uh, often support um, the Hungry Children Foundation. And you've probably seen me post about it or retweet it. Uh, mm -hmm. This is a group in Venezuela that like feeds hungry kids and supports the local orphanage. And like they're building a cool little school for um, they call street children, children who just sort of like wander around the street and like don't really have a place to stay. And so that's all amazing. But 
PayPal takes a 25% cut of anything donated to them. So crypto has been a lifesaver. It's been a massive lifeline of getting donations over there, getting them resources. Uh, and that's like, you can't do that without crypto because of sanctions, because of taxes, because of all these other reasons. And um, I just think like that, that is one of the use cases that I think is is mind blowing. We also saw uh, during during the pandemic, it doesn't really matter like what side of the pandemic you're on or like politically, but like the, the thing that shocked me was that the truckers, I don't even like they were protesting or they, they had some sort of movement um, and the government didn't like it for whatever reason. Maybe it was valid, maybe it was invalid. It, Again, I'm not as concerned about that as I was with the fact that their bank accounts were frozen, the GoFundMe accounts were frozen, and so their right to protest was completely cut off and halted, and so were their livelihoods immediately. And anyone associated with those protests could also have their bank accounts frozen. And the only way to protect yourself from that sort of action uh, is DeFi. So like, Mm -hmm. when I first got into DeFi, I was all in on that narrative, which is like decentralized finance protects your funds and gives you actual ownership and custody of your own assets. So like bank account can't be frozen, assets can't be seized. They are yours and you can take them anywhere as long as you have like something that looks like a flash drive in your back pocket. Uh, and that that's super cool. That's one very practical use case for for people who want ownership of their own life. Now the other use cases like real world assets, tokenized bonds, um, you know, uh, centralized bank deposit currencies or whatever, CBDCs, I always forget the acronym. Like all of those things are coming uh, and like we're not, gonna, we're not going to avoid them. And I think they're great. I honestly think that adoption is amazing, that having a ledger do a lot of the things that humans are doing now is way more efficient and transparent and that having transactions on a blockchain is much better than having transactions in a, in a black box that no one can see. Uh, it'll hopefully help bring transparency to a lot of uh, what's going on in the world of of like finance and international transactions? I mean, I know Senator Warren will talk a lot about how crypto is used to money launder and for drugs and the black market. Anyone who was around during like 2012, like the the height of the Silk Road, maybe that was true then, right? The only real use case for Bitcoin was buying things on the Silk Road. Uh, shout out to any viewers who ever used that. You know who you were, but. Now it's not. Now crypto is a totally different thing, and vast majority of money laundering is done through through like legitimate financial means and not actually on chain. Uh, because why would you do it on chain when it's trackable? Things like Monero have a niche use case. Sure, there are also privacy chains, but they're not really used. Uh, so, <clears throat> what I think people are going to be using crypto for in the future is for the like. Permissionless transactions, um, permissionless interactions with tools, hopefully for like collateralizing things that would otherwise be unaffordable to collateralize, uh, for bringing assets on chain. We'll see if that works out. I think there is going to be use case for that. I'm really interested in things like Landex, where you're empowering farmers in a decentralized way to uh, be able to afford loans they other- otherwise couldn't afford and like start their business. Um, and then like bring on tokenized corn and tokenized soy and tokenized whatever, and people participate in those markets. Uh, internationally. Like that stuff really gets me going and it makes me excited. Will it get momentum? I hope so. Um, but I'm not sure. So there's like what's probably gonna happen, which is like these these uh centralized banks currencies that will come on chain and like take over all of uh the financial landscape. And then what I really want to happen, which is you know, uh things become tokenized and legitimate and legitimized um in a way that we can interact. Like I could sell my car on chain and it would be totally legal and totally uh, totally valid, and I wouldn't have to like go to a notary. I wouldn't have to go to some like DMV because it's all on chain. There's a ledger. It's like non falsifiable, and so that things just become way faster. I want things to become faster because of blockchain technology, and I also want everyone in the world to have access to the most robust financial tools in existence, which exist on chain and they exist permissionlessly. Wow, spoken. spoken Mouthful. I'm so sorry. Well. Um, yeah, I, I think it will take over and my thesis, why is, I guess there's threefold first, it makes things more liquid, right? You could more easily uh, trade something instantly. In most cases, 24 hours a day. It also allows people to earn yield on things. And this is something I hadn't really thought of until I talked to someone in TradFi who was interested in DeFi. And he was saying that right now, for example, if you hold gold, it's kind of difficult to do anything with it. But if you were holding gold tokenized on chain i mean even today with pax gold you can actually earn yield on your gold by providing liquidity or by lending it out and uh once these tradfi institutions and once other people 
realize that's an option. And once the correct rails are do that are in place to do that safely, then it's going to become pretty difficult for them to ignore the fact they could be earning yield on something that they're holding. Uh, and then third reason why I think it's going to take over, and this is probably the main one, is that once you hit critical mass of people using things in a tokenized wallet, uh, just the other day you had Larry Fink, CEO of BlackRock, talking about how you could have a, a ledger, a single ledger that recorded which stocks and bonds people owned. Mm -hmm. Once you have a critical mass of people doing things tokenized, and I tend to think the first things will probably be things that are maybe not as serious as stocks and bonds, like something like right. a rewards program. But I think it's going to become like phone, where at first you had lots of apps on your phone, mm -hmm. and then it turned into eventually almost everyone, at least most, I would say, people in the actually even in the developed developing world, but in the developed world, most people have smartphones. Yep. Uh, and when you go to restaurants, sometimes now they just have a QR code. It's it's almost assumed that you know yeah. because it's so ubiquitous, everything runs uh, through the phone, same way that everything runs through the internet now. And I feel like once enough things become tokenized then slowly and then suddenly it will become the path of least resistance for storing right. and, and then and we'll have like technology where you don't even realize what you're interacting with is blockchain because yeah. it's so seamless and and user friendly yeah absolutely absolutely uh, and then eventually it'll be the point where when something's not on blockchain it's kind of even if people don't know why it'd be like hey this right. thing doesn't this thing doesn't integrate with i, I can't <laughs> use it with the same app right. that it's i usually clunky. what's going on here yeah, exactly. Like I can't use my normal whatever app. Whoever makes the app that everyone mm -hmm. is interacting with is going to make a ton of money. Um, yeah, that's really interesting. So I want to make sure we get a chance to dive into how you research because we got tons of questions on Twitter about your research process. Yeah, 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 definitely. Um, absolutely. So to start, do you think you could walk us through how you find DeFi opportunities? That is a great question. Um, is completely dependent upon my my current thesis. So when I am in like bear market mode, uh, that's going to look totally different from when I'm in bull market mode or when I'm in delta neutral mode. And the reason why is because you need strategies that fit your thesis. So the first thing you need like a a foundational layer of of strategic understanding. So like what strategies fit a specific type of thesis. So for uh, being bearish, you want to know how to short probably through perps through money markets, through options, and even through leveraged liquidity provision. If you understand those four things, great. Now you have a great foundation or useful functional foundation for where you want to start looking. You need to find protocols like lending markets, perpetual protocols, options protocols, and leveraged liquidity provision protocols that uh, will allow you to short assets. And then you go, um, you can use DeFi Llama. I love DeFi Llama. I used to also use uh, Nanoly, which is which used to be called, I used to have a really funny name. Um, coin dicks, that's what it was, uh, but not not like spelled that way. But they changed to Nanoly probably because it was such a silly name. Uh, that's also a great protocol. Um, APY Vision, another good place to find yield for like UniB3 positions. Um, DeFi Llama, probably most people's go to. Uh, DeFi Llama also has like this yields page, which is which is phenomenal. You can, uh, I mean, I, I'll share my screen, I'll, I'll uh, show you yeah, guys. Go for it. So, this is definitely something that I use a lot when searching for yields. I mean, I used to use it a lot more because uh, when I was first getting started, I didn't have like a really robust community and I didn't really know where to go otherwise. And so like, if you want to find a yield on an asset, for me, like ETH and BTC are two that I go to frequently. Um, you just literally type in ETH. This is in the yield section of DeFi Llama. And it'll give you just thousands of different ETH yields. And so you can sort by attribute. I often like pairs that have no impermanent loss. And this means like two pairs with the same delta, effectively the same delta. So you might see something like ETH Steeth. Uh, so Steeth is Lido ETH. If you LP these two, you're not going to get impermanent loss because they they move uh, with the same delta. And so okay, 1.8 percent, not very attractive. You can sort by things like. Um, TVL. So you probably don't want to mess with the protocol with less than a million dollars. So you can look at all of those and then you can sort by APY. So this is this is one of many tools to use to find things that fit your thesis. Uh, but for me, again, know your thesis, which is like short, delta, neutral, or long, uh, and then know what strategies fit those thesis. So for short, like I said, uh, actually shorting through perpetual protocols. So you should have a list of perpetual protocols in mind. Uh, whether those be like centralized exchanges that you trust or decentralized perpetual exchanges. 
Uh, and you can always find those as well through uh, DeFi Llama. And then leveraged liquidity provision. So the way you short with that is, uh, well, we can actually look here. Um, one great example of doing that would be uh, Francium, which I used to call Frankium because I didn't understand the word. <laughs> On this protocol, what you can do is when you are, and also um, another one is Alpha Homora. They converted to something else. I forget their new name. Uh, what was it? It'll come to me at like the end of this, this interview. But when you are borrowing an asset, <clears throat> like if you're doing a USDC, uh, I don't know, shadow pair, which has 82% to 128% um, APY, what you want to do is borrow the volatile asset because when you borrow all the volatile asset at max leverage, what you're doing to enter into that LP is shorting it. So you'll, you'll start off with a short position on the volatile asset. And so if you're bearish, this is fantastic. You're getting a 128% APR while also being short on half of your LP or the borrowed portion of your or borrowed and sold portion of that LP. And then of course, with perpetual protocols, you can just open up uh, naked shorts or leverage shorts, whatever you want. And then with options, sort of the same thing, you can buy put options. So have a thesis and then know where to find opportunities for that. Then for delta neutrality, so if like if you're not sure what to do, you just want to have like basically getting yield on stable coins. Uh, my go-to is typically arbitrage. I love funding rate arbitrage. Uh, in fact, I built a funding rate arbitrage calculator. Um, let's see if I have it I have right here. I say I built it. I built it with the help of my community. My community did a lot of the heavy lifting here, and so like you can type in any asset. Uh, let's do Adam. And during the uh, the bear market, when I wasn't sure where the bottom was going to be, I didn't you know know when things were going to go up. I loved funding rate arbitrage. What you look for is a difference between the funding rates over like a reasonable time frame. So let's just say past ten days. Uh, we're looking at Adam. Looks like the funding rate is highest on DYDX. So that's where you would want to short. So you go to DYDX, and you'd want to long where it's the smallest. So on KuCoin. So you long on KuCoin. That's fifteen percent APR. Now that wasn't mind blowing, but during the uh, the bear market, if you get fifteen percent on stable coins, that was pretty good. And I was using things like Hubble Exchange and, and doing that, um, and getting like thirty percent annualized throughout nearly the entire bear market, which was phenomenal for me. I was uh, pretty happy with that. But now that I'm long, most of what I'm doing is like peg arbitrage, and peg arbitrage is one of my favorite strategies where effectively you look for something that is depegged and you you play the repeg. So there are so many examples of this. I think some of the most famous examples that people are probably familiar with is when Lido ETH depegged. Uh, it was a mm -hmm. massive depeg by I think like up to 9% was its largest depeg and Shanghai was coming, right? So the ability to unstake your ETH was coming maybe like four or five months down the road. And people sort of knew that. And if they trusted in that, they could have bought Lido ETH 9% under peg. Uh, and there are even ways to leverage this. So they could have bought it 9% under peg, collateralized on Aave, borrowed ETH against it, swapped that ETH for some more 9% depeg, collateralized and loop that. So effectively, you're getting you know four to five times, well, maybe 3.5 at 75% at LTV, uh, 3x leverage on that 8% 8, 8 depeg. So you're getting, you know if it repegs and it did, that's a total return on investment of like 24% on ETH, which is amazing. It's, it's phenomenal. So like there are these repeg plays, basically all you're looking for is FUD uh, because people are like, oh no, USDC mm. depegged. Thank you, going to buy it because you can you can do the math and do the diligence. Uh, there was that Silicon Valley bank thing and the first thing that happened there was all of the smartest people in the DeFi dojo who are way smarter than I am. Uh, I call it a decentralized think tank because it really is. And I am humbled by the fact that those people choose to be in that discord were like clearly smarter than I am. They're doing the research saying, okay, well, what is what is the discount on the actual backing of USDC if Silicon Valley is completely insolvent? They say, okay, well, that that actual backing value that still exists is currently 7% higher than the price of USDC. So even if USDC had to liquidate uh, all the underlying backing, it would still be worth more than it is now. So we're going to buy this here, and then we'll even leverage it if we want to. And they made a killing. Uh, I think that was phenomenal. Same thing with the Anchor BNB DPEG. So, uh, ST BNB, no, sorry, BNBX, which is Stater BNB, DPEGed, I think 90% because Anchor BNB DPEGed and they were in a three pool. So, because they were in a three pool, when one DPEG brought down the other ones, 
but only Anchor BNB was affected by an exploit, which meant that BNBX was completely unexposed to that exploit, but 90% under peg, which meant the backing value wow. of it was still completely there. And you had a, only a five day redemption period. So many people in the Discord made like 90%. Uh, actually, no, they made like 5x because, you know, if you buy it at 20% uh, of its value and then it goes to parity, it's a 5x uh, trade right there. So I love repeg plays. One of them right now that I've talked about publicly is Stone. Uh, so right now, Stone is 5% depegged. We were talking about it when it was 12% depegged. Uh, so congratulations to anyone who is listening. Stone is 5% depegged because the way Stone works right now is people are playing the Manta airdrop. You take your ETH, you go through the New Pacific Bridge, and it automatically converts into Stone. Stone is an LST that represents Lido staked ETH. It's effectively wrapped Lido staked ETH. It is 100% backed by Lido staked ETH. And you cannot bridge it back. So the only way to redeem Stone is to wait until March 10th, then bridge it back, and then you can redeem it through the stone, stake stone contract. But until then, you can't get it off of Manta. And so people who want to exit have to sell it for ETH and then bridge the ETH back. And so the only way to exit stone right now is to sell it. As a result, it became wildly depegged down to 15%. It's still 5% depegged. But you know that on March 10th, they will open the bridge back up for stone. You can take it back to stake stone and you can unstake it. So there's a lot of things that you have to be able to do. One is recognize a depeg or recognize... Um, a, a poorly priced asset. Uh, the, the only way that I can do this is by being a part of a community. Now, it doesn't have to be my community. There are so many great communities out there. Uh, Taiki has an excellent community. I think Delphi Digital has a decent community. Nansen has a pretty good community. Um, DGen Score has a great community. Uh, but I use mine because I think mine is, I'm clearly biased, right? And so we are all sort of always playing with DeFi. As a result, when something comes up, someone will mention it, and then we'll all sort of like collectively diligence it together. Uh, this was one of those opportunities. Another one that we we sort of found was um, uh, Cream ETH. So when Cream ETH depegged, because uh, because there was this whale selling it who hadn't touched his Cream ETH in two years, my immediate reaction was, oh, it's Cream. They've been exploited like 10 times. Of course it's going to depeg. They're just a bad protocol. But then again, you know, wiser minds than me said, no, let's look into this. I've seen the contracts. They're actually not that bad. This is a liquid staking protocol. There's no reason this should be depegging. So they did a ton of wallet forensics. And what we found was that the owner of that wallet who was dumping was like a previous fund manager and that fund was being uh, insolvent. So they had to liquidate their assets. So there was uh, a that massive deep research. Right. Yeah. So ex that's what I'm saying. You need to have these people around you that you can sort of rely on. That's it's, it's a weird edge and it's weird to like try to tell you how to go do this. Um, but I'm going to get to strategies that are a lot more replicatable and, and research that's a lot more replicatable. Um, so anyways, they did the research. We all sort of aped into that. Again, really, really good arbitrage play. Um, and it paid off. Like right now, Cream ETH has converted to Mavith. Mavith is finally redeemable. And so anyone who bought Cream ETH when it was 25% under peg uh, made a killing. And, and that was awesome. Uh, ETH2 was another one of these Shanghai plays. It was really, really good from, from KuCoin. It was like also 20% depegged. I also posted about that. So uh, I love depegged assets. Um, not, not all of them are created equal. There are some depegged assets that are depegged because they're garbage or because the backing has been rugged or for, for many other reasons. That's why you have to not only find the opportunity, but then really seriously uh, diligence that opportunity. Um, okay, so <laughs> the other things that you can do if you're long and uh, and you just want like easier things to find, right? One strategy that most people will probably like is um, leverage liquid staking. So leverage liquid, liquid staking is something that, that anyone can do uh, that that effectively just takes your your yield on your staking yield for your LST, your liquid stake token, and leverage it up. So take wrap stake ETH for example. Right, wrap stake ETH has a has a base yield of around three point five percent to four percent, and you can collateralize that on virtually every lending platform on on ETH mainnet and on the L twos. When you collateralize that, you can then borrow ETH against it. Let me share my screen again and sort of like walk you guys through this because uh, this strategy is an amazing strategy for a number of reasons. One of which is because you get single delta exposure to assets you like. So let me. Share my screen. Ave, this is the one. Or an Arbitrum. Arbitrum probably has decent rates. Yeah, 2.4%. Sure, that's good. So <clears throat> um, right now, actually, let me also pull up. 
I'm going to share my screen instead of my uh, window. There we go. Or my window instead of my screen. So I can show you two things. Because building tools is also a really useful thing to do. So here we have wrap staked ETH uh, right here. And you can borrow ETH against it. So if wrap staked ETH has a base yield of 3.5%, and you can borrow ETH against it for 2.41%, what you do is you convert that borrowed ETH back into wrap staked ETH, collateralize it, and repeat that process. So <clears throat> let's just say there's a 1% difference between the borrow rate you have to pay on ETH and the yield you can get on wrap staked ETH. There's a 1% difference. That means each time you add to the wrap staked ETH, you're effectively getting an additional percent on your yield. So if you and right now, there's something called E-mode on, on Aave V3, which allows you to have really, really high LTVs or very a, a ton of leverage. And one thing you all guys also might not know, which is why you have to follow governance proposals, which is a whole other bag of worms, is that uh, Aave has effectively pegged wrap stake ETH or Lido ETH one-to-one -one with ETH. So there's, there's no risk of liquidation as long as they maintain that mechanism. If Lido ETH depegs, it doesn't matter because they consider it one-to-one -one with ETH. So let's look at what the yield would actually look like, right? So 3.5% on wrap staked ETH, 2.4% on ETH. Go over to, uh, I made a bunch of these little calculators. You can use basic leverage here. You can use 93% LTV, which is nuts. Uh, borrow cost is 2.41. Collateral yield is 3.5. So you can leverage up your yield by 14X, which is crazy. And you can get a total yield of 17.98% on ETH just on Aave. So you're not doing anything crazy or exotic with your ETH, with like, you know, LPs. You're not exposed to impermanent loss. You're not exposed to liquidation because, again, Lido ETH is pegged, uh, hard-coded one-to-one with uh, ETH on, on Aave. And so this is a really compelling yield. And it's also scalable. There are tens of, actually hundreds of millions of dollars already doing this strategy on Aave. So you're not going to dilute it with a small bag. Um, I do think like it's hard to compete with 17% on your ETH. Uh, this is incredible. Wow. So this is one strategy that anyone can do, and you can do this with all sorts of different protocols. There's also uh, UX, where you can do this with your um, ST Atom. So if you want to be exposed to Atom, you can do this with ST Atom Atom. If you want to do this with Solana, you can go to uh, MarginFi and do, and like they have, they have an automated process for this on MarginFi. So I love uh, what I call Delta One Yields, which is just like, you only have direct exposure to the asset you want to be long on. No impermanent loss, uh, <clears throat> no real risk of liquidation, unless there's a serious DPEG, but you have to you know, know your LSTs. Okay, if you, whatever, exit. Um, actually, Camino doesn't know. Camino. Camino uses margin phi. Uh, so Camino, you can just click multiply, and all of these strategies are doing exactly that. They are collateralizing G2 Sol, B Sol, or M Sol, borrowing Solana, converting it back to the liquid staked version, which is G2 Sol, M Sol, or B Sol, and then just looping that. And so you can see you can get 17%, 14 to 17% on your Solana. And Solana has been ripping. So if you don't want to be exposed to multiple assets, you just like Solana. Well, it makes no sense to just hold it when you can go to Camino. By the way, Camino has no token yet. They, they have a point system. They're going to have an airdrop. So you can go, you can airdrop farm while being exposed to Solana while getting 17%. How cool is that? So also, if you do it with Very baseball, cool. you're also getting qualified for, uh, I think it's Blaze is the protocol, Blaze mm -hmm. Solana. So the, the, the real goal is not to have a researching method. The real goal is to learn the fundamentals of strategy. If you know how to long things and do long strategies like liquid, uh, like liquid staking leverage, which is what I just explained, or peg arbitrage, which I explained before that, um, then like you know where to look because you already know what you're looking for. Uh, like I talked about with shorting um, strategies, if you know those different strategies, then you'll know where to find them. You're looking for perpetual protocols. You're looking for leveraged uh, liquidity provision protocols. You're looking for options protocols. Like <clears throat> you need to first understand the strategies for your thesis and have a thesis. If you don't have a thesis, you're 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 out of luck. You have to have a thesis. Uh, and then you can actualize it by by learning the strategies. And the best way to learn strategies is by playing with protocols and talking to people who do strategies. So uh, I recommend joining a community. Of course, DeFi Dojo would love to have you. Um, but there's tons of content out there, least of which is, uh, or not least of which is done by uh, our host here, our lovely host. So 
Like there's always, just keep learning, um, have a thesis, figure out some strategies and uh, you can go from there. Thank you, thank you. Um, one other question we had from Twitter that's related is, how do you think about the balance between the counterparty risk of providing liquidity to these protocols and the risk of exploits and hacks, of course, uh, versus the opportunity cost of just holding spot? That is an excellent question. Uh, and I've gotten burnt a few times <clears throat> um, for that very reason. So there are a bunch of things to consider. And I would say one is know the statistics. So statistically speaking, the most dangerous type of protocol is a money market or a borrowing and lending platform. Uh, so I really only trust the major borrowing and lending platforms on each protocol. If I'm doing like a leverage stake looping that I just showed you on Aave, I'm only going to do it on Aave. There are dozens of borrowing and lending platforms, some that I really love. And I would give a shout out to them, but I'm like, I'm not using them. So I feel bad. Like, uh, you know, I'll give a shout out. Like Dolomite. I love Dolomite. I think it's a fantastic protocol. Very novel. The fact they allow you to use like Pendle assets to get like fixed rate returns as collateral. That is so cool. But the number one most exploited type of protocol uh, per capita is borrowing and lending platforms. So using a new borrowing and lending platform because it has a really good interest rate or because it like pays you to collateralize is just not a risk adjusted thing to do in my book. Um, so like I, I wouldn't be doing that. Camino is one of the largest protocols on Solana. I don't mind taking the risk there. I also know the Camino team um, personally because I've met them uh, a couple of times. Great guys. Really, really, really security conscious. Uh, but so is Euler. So like I, I would not have been the kind of guy to dodge Euler. I would have been hit by the Euler protocol hack had I not pulled my assets from there to do something different literally like five days before. So <clears throat> I got lucky with Euler. Uh, that was audited by Trail of Bits. It was audited by Open Zeppelin. It should have been a protected protocol. And even the piece of code that was exploited was audited by one of the top four people on Code for Arena. So like it checked all of the boxes, uh, but still got exploited. And so like you can't dodge every bullet, but what you can do is diversify in such a way that if you do get hit by an exploit, it's only a small portion of your portfolio. Now, in the dojo, what we tell people who are just starting on DeFi is do not put more than 5% of your portfolio into any one exposure. Uh, now, that exposure can be a protocol. It can be a type of protocol. It can be like a specific asset. I know that's a super low number, and I absolutely do not follow that rule. But if you are new and you are looking for basic risk you know, uh, rules, it's a good rule of thumb. And it'll, it'll prevent you from aping in 100% of your portfolio into a brand new protocol for the big shiny number. Uh, so, you know, maybe the number for you is 10%. Maybe you have other parameters. Um, for the most part, counterparty risk is the scariest with fresh new protocols that are unaudited uh, or, you know, low TVL protocols. And then uh, there are specific sort of counterparty risks depending on the type of protocol. So for liquidity provision, I'm not really worried about counterparty risk because your counterparty uh, is like swappers and they're not, they can't really do anything to, to hurt you. Um, at least if you're providing liquidity for, for things that uh, have pre-existing deep liquidity elsewhere. If you're providing liquidity for an asset that only has liquidity on that platform, yeah, you can definitely get wrecked. But uh, you should know your types of counterparty risk. One counterparty risk that I am particularly conscious of is uh, for CPVs. So CPVs are counterparty vaults. So you are clearly exposed to a counterparty here. Uh, a CPV, an example of this is like GLP. So GLP is a counterparty vault. Um, there are counterparty vaults on Levana. I think this is a great example of why you don't want to be exposed to counterparty vaults. There are counterparty vaults on um, Jupiter, which is going to have an airdrop soon. So Jupiter actually has a perp dex, uh, very similar to, to GMX, and they have counterparty vaults there. Uh, GDI is a counterparty vault. So all of these counterparty vaults are exposed to the trader PNL on those platforms. Now, this is great in a choppy, bearish market. It's phenomenal. Like these, these products tend to do really well, or at least they're like more or less up only over large enough time horizons. But the moment things get bullish, because there is a bullish bias or a long bias in crypto, these things get torn up. The Levana vaults almost across the board have been wrecked. The uh, the GMX GLP like it's not doing that great. Even though the yields for the like the GMX V2, even though the yields are above forty percent, the the realizable uh, returns are pretty low, if not negative. And so I don't want counterparty risk to traders during a bull market. And I think that should be um, 
a thesis that most will take as a, as a risk parameter. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then in, <clears throat> in terms of like, uh, there are other money market counterparty. Like you have to know what the counterparty risk is in order to intelligently address it. Um, so like UniV3, I have no concern with counterparty risk. Uh, Aave, I have no real concern with counterparty risk because I know they have a massive chest to compensate users uh, in the event of exploit or hack. And then with smaller money markets, your large counterparty risk is exposure to other collateral types. So when you don't have siloed uh, money markets, basically if there's a very, very low liquidity or low market cap piece of collateral, people can manipulate that. It's called like uh, uh, Oracle exploit where they can shoot the price up with a low amount of capital, borrow all of, let's just say, the USDC available or USDT available on that platform, and then the asset could crash and they, and no one can get their, uh, no liquidations can actually occur. It's impossible for liquidations to occur. So the the protocol goes bankrupt. This is this happens on uh, various smaller money markets. So I guess like the, it's really hard to answer any of these questions without just like a boatload of nuance. Mm-hmm. Um, but what I would recommend is if counterparty risk is a serious consideration for you, and it absolutely should be, uh, then start with the largest protocols to understand how to actualize your strategic thesis um, and only when the yield seems worth it. So uh, one of the best things you can do is hold, which is why I love to have single-sided exposure to assets, which is why you see me doing leverage stake looping on ETH because I don't want to be exposed to impermanent loss. I don't. Oftentimes it doesn't pay off well. Uh, I don't want to be exposed to permanent loss on Solana. So I look for s- single-sided exposures that I feel are risk-adjusted, and uh, I get yield on my longs. Awesome. Awesome. Now, uh, going to do a few lighter questions to wrap things up. Uh, unfortunately, I don't think we'll have time to get to everything from Twitter because there were a lot, but... Um, I should be more oh, brief. I'm sorry. No, no, no. That, that wasn't a dig at you, but um, no, there were a lot of questions, um, and, and that information was honestly, honestly golden. I'm probably going to watch watch this back a couple of times after we finish recording. But um, first question uh, was, if you weren't in crypto, what industries or niches would you be focused on right now? Uh, education. I mean, I, I loved being a philosophy teacher. It was uh, my dream job. So, I mean, what I'm doing now, I never could have dreamed of and is way better. But if I wasn't doing this, uh, I would continue to pursue that. I love teaching ethics and logic. Um, So I would probably continue to pursue that. Incredible. And then this is kind of similar to a question I asked before, but how do you view crypto macro in the world in general looking 15 years from now? It's too far out. I mean, you know, we know crypto one month is one year. Uh, Actually, during the bull market, it almost seems flipped. Like uh, one month seems like a day. During the bear market, it was definitely one month is a year. Um, yeah, I have no idea. I do imagine, you know, Bitcoin will probably still be around. Uh, blockchains will still be around. I don't know if like non EVM L1s will take over. If like mechanisms like Celestia with, with modularity data availability will take over. Uh, I do think that will happen. Um, but to what extent? I don't know. 15 years is enough time for regulation to actually do something. Uh, so I think there will be regulation. Um, I hope that people can still do anything from anywhere uh, with non-custodial wallets. But um, yeah, I don't know. I I hope that it's still the Wild West that it is now, but with way better operational security. Incredible. What about the world at large? Any any major changes that you see Uh, happening? Yeah, so I think what we see in in many, I guess like what what you might call third world or second world countries with the the widespread adoption of like uh, Tether or USDT, I do think we're gonna we're gonna continue to see that emerge, particularly as like um, currencies like the the Turkish I think it's the Turkish lira um, like suffer for like macroeconomic reasons, and so uh, that I think will be like a, a, a global way to onboard people to utilizing non custodial wallets, and that's a great entrance or gateway into um, more DeFi. Uh, protocols and DeFi usage uh, at large. And then, you know, we're probably going to see these um, CBDCs uh, start to get inter- integrated into like more traditional society. Incredible. That's a great, inspiring note to leave it on. Thanks so much for joining us today, Stephen. This has been great. I've learned a lot personally, and I think that it's going to be really valuable for people. Well, it's been a pleasure, man. Uh, thanks for the questions. Sorry for rambling so much. Wish I could no, answer I apologize. It was It was golden. Thank you.